Have you ever looked at the birds and wish you could fly? On the other hand, have you ever wondered how a huge airplane is able to stay up in the air? Today on NASA Connect, we're going to show you how the shape of a plane affects its flight. I'm Van Hughes. Hi, and I'm Shelley Canwright. Welcome to NASA Connect, the show that connects you to the world of math, science, and NASA. Right now, we're coming to you from the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum located in Washington, D.C. And Shelley, this is the perfect location to talk about the shape of planes. Hey, that's right, Van. If there's one place where you can experience the entire story of flight, this is it. The National Air and Space Museum is home to 356 aircraft where collectively they reflect the science of flight. The museum is home to the first airplane developed by the Wright brothers. Notice how the propellers are in the back and the stabilizing wings are in the front. There's the Fokker T2, the first plane to cross America coast to coast, and Charles Lindbergh's Spirit of St. Louis, the first airplane to fly non-stop across the Atlantic. Then there are other planes which pushed aircraft design even further. The Bell X-1 is a cross between a plane and a rocket. It was the first airplane to break the sound barrier. The Grumman X-29 has backward-looking wings. It goes so fast that the wings were deliberately designed to be unstable in order to enhance the aircraft's maneuverability. The museum also houses the Voyager. Notice how long the wings are. This wingspan ratio enabled pilots Dick Rutan and Jeannie Yeager to fly non-stop, non-refueled around the world. Boy, Shelley, there are a lot of different shapes here. Imagine what the Wright brothers would have designed if they would have had access to today's math and scientific tools. Hey, you're right, Van. You know, it's important to know that science and technology are closely related. Our need to know and understand drives scientific research and leads to the development of technological products. Well, Shelley, that's what our show, Shapes of Flight, is all about today. You'll see this interaction between math and science technology as we look at the process of airplane design. Hey, you know what? We're going to talk to some NASA researchers who will show us the process and the tools to research, develop, test and evaluate airplane designs. They'll share some challenging problems that they're working on and their solutions, which might result in configurations for future aircraft. And later on, you'll be able to interact live with our researchers by calling in or emailing your questions to the researchers in the NASA Connect studio. We'll also be joined by students from Jones Magnet Middle School in Hampton, Virginia, who will conduct a flight experiment and share their data with us. And there's much more to this program on the internet. Whenever you see the NASA Connect website appear on the screen, that will be your clue to check out the site for more information, fun, and activities relating to our discussion. All right, and so Van, my question to you, have you ever wanted to fly like a bird? Of course. <laughs> you have? Well, there's one place I know of that's as close to flying like a bird as you can get. It's in North Carolina, not far from where the Wright brothers flew the first airplane. How would you like to go there and learn about the four forces of flight? Well, sure. All right, first off, can you name the four forces? Okay, we have drag, lift, weight, and thrust. Hey, that's right. Drag is a force which slows the forward movement of an airplane as it pushes through the air. Lift is created when the air pressure above a wing is less than the pressure below it. Thrust is created by a power source which gives an airplane forward motion. And weight is a force of gravity pulling an airplane down. Well, you can learn about these four forces in a real hands-on way, like by hang gliding. Interested? Well, how long will it take us to get there? Oh, about as fast as I can snap my fingers. You well, I'm, I'm all ready. Ready to go. <laughs> all right then, gang. Well, I'm going to send Van on assignment to Jockey's Ridge State Park in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina to experience flight firsthand. In the meantime, I'm going to North Carolina also. I'm going to Dare County to talk with some experimental aviators who are pushing the envelope of flight, just like our early aviation pioneers. Let's go. I'm here at the Regalo Kite Festival here in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. People from all over the world come here to fly their kites on the same sand dunes that the Wright brothers used to fly the very first airplane. Now, did you know that the Chinese were the first people to fly kites? Almost 3,000 years ago, the Chinese built kites out of silk and bamboo. For years, the kite has been thought of as a trivial toy, but history tells us that the kite is so much more than a toy. Throughout history, kites have been used by civil engineers to construct bridges, and perhaps most famously, by Ben Franklin to study electricity. Why even NASA has studied kites? 
Matter of fact, this kite festival is named for a famous NASA researcher and his work with the flexible wing. Mr. Francis Regalo, known as the father of hang gliding, created the paraglider. That was one of the possible design solutions for returning a space capsule back to Earth. Mr. Regalo is here today for this kite festival. He has given me some background on how a flexible wing works. Want to know more? Visit the NASA Connect website. And you know, Van, if you'd like to fly, we can go out there and go hang gliding. Oh, wow, uh, that'd be great. Yeah, uh, right now? Right now, let's All go. All right, <laughs> let's go. We'll be back in just a few moments to catch up with Van, but right now we're here at Windy Manio, North Carolina. Actually, we're at the Dare County Airport, where Air Venture 98 is just about ready to get underway. Air Venture 98, now that's an air race for experimental aircraft. But not too far from here is Kitty Hawk, which is the site of the first historic powered air flight in 1903. The Wright brothers changed the world forever when Orville Wright went up into the air for the first successful heavier-than-air flight. This machine was just one step in a broad experimental program that began with a glider kite that they built in 1899. Not only did they build the first successful plane, but they built the first wind tunnel, and they had to find out for themselves the dynamics of lift, drag, weight, and thrust on a shape. Ever since the Wright brothers successfully tested their flying machine off the sand dunes of Kitty Hawk, we've seen a multitude of designers, builders, and adventurers trying to take their machines to someplace faster, farther, and higher. Well, that's what Air Venture 98 is all about. It honors those people. They will set off right here from historic North Carolina and set sail across the skies to Oshkosh, Wisconsin, where they are set to kick off the largest experimental aircraft air show in North America, Oshkosh. Aviation enthusiasts annually gather in Oshkosh to witness firsthand new design concepts and technologies that could open up new vistas to the field of aeronautical engineering and to personal and commercial aircraft venues. AirVenture brings out many different personalities and many different extraordinary looking aircraft. Joining me right now is a very special personality, Hoot Gibson, who is a former astronaut, was a commander on four missions, and has flown over 60 different airplanes. And behind me you can see the airplane he's going to be racing in. How about giving us a little lowdown on this big plane? Well, Shelley, this airplane is a Hawker Sea Fury, built by the British right after World War II. So right in the late 40s and early 50s is when these airplanes started flying. It's a really interesting bird. Uh, it's a very big, heavy, powerful machine. It weighs about 9,000 pounds. It has a 3,000 horsepower engine in it. And as you can see, it's got about a 14-foot diameter propeller. As you can see, the wings fold, yeah, of course. It yeah. used to be a carrier fighter, was what the British used mm -hmm. it for. And you always want to minimize the size of the airplane when it's time to stow oh. it away on the carrier. So you fold the wings and it takes up a lot less space. The, the wings actually cost you a little bit of weight because you've got to put in some mechanism to make the wings fold and to mm -hmm. lock the wings because of course you want to lock them when they're down. You don't want them folding up by themselves, obviously. Yeah. Well, I have a final question for you. This is what I call a tortoise and hare question. Your plane certainly is bigger than any other airplane that's going to be in this air race. So, given that, which plane do you think is going to be your closest competitor in this race? I'm not even sure, Shelley, that we're going to win this race. We do have the biggest, most powerful, heaviest airplane out here but it doesn't have any kind of guarantee that we're going to win. The other airplane that I think is real fast and may be a real problem for us is the Lancer 4 mm. with the Chevrolet V8 engine in it with the five-bladed propeller. I think he's going to be very fast. Mm. And he's going to fly a lot higher. He can be up in the 25 to 30,000 foot range. We're going to be quite a bit lower. We're going to be down around 20,000 feet, somewhere around there. All so right. he's going to be some real competition, I think, on this length of a race. So there's a lot of variables in here that are going to enter into this race. There really are. So stay tuned and we'll see who comes out ahead. Well, gang, as you can see, designing and building an airplane takes an awful lot of work. And among that, it takes some problem-solving strategies. Now, that means you've got to be able to identify and understand just what the question or problem is so you can begin to investigate it. 
Right now, you're going to meet some of today's researchers who are involved in the shapes of flight. As you meet this research team, consider the role of mathematics and mathematical tools in scientific inquiry, the value of collaborations and teamwork in conducting research, and the engineering process and its application in everyday life. The leader of this design team is Mike Logan. Airplane design is a team effort. Like any good team, every job is important. As project engineer, it's my job to shepherd the aircraft through its stages in the life cycle. To define the problem, let's look at a current challenge. 20 years from now, NASA wants an airplane that will carry twice as many passengers as today's airliners and transport them to their destination at half the cost. That's a big challenge, especially when you consider that the airplanes of the future will have to be quieter, safer, more fuel efficient, and more environmentally friendly. The next step in the process, then, is to propose solutions. This is Paul Gelhausen. He's one of our designers on our team. Paul, why don't you talk about one of the solutions you're working on? Well, the solution that's up here is the blended wing body concept. It's a radically, radical change from the 747 type airplane, which is a tube with wings. We've gotten rid of the bumps and some of the bulges that are on the, on the traditional airplane that has a glide ratio of about 18. And, and put them into an, a much more clean aerodynamic shape that, had, uh, that will have a glide ratio of 23, we hope. Thanks, Paul. Step three in the engineering problem solving method is to analyze and evaluate solutions. To do that in the airplane world, we think about the four basic forces on an airplane, lift, drag, thrust, and weight. Those four forces have to be in balance for the airplane to work. To do that, we turn to experts in the field. This is Karen Deere. She's one of our nozzle researchers that helps us look at thrust. Karen, why don't you talk about what a nozzle researcher does? I design and research nozzle concepts to determine which is the best candidate for generating thrust for an airplane. Sir Isaac Newton's third principle, which states for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, helps us understand thrust. If we use a balloon to demonstrate this, uh, we allow the air inside the balloon to escape through the opening, we see the motion of the balloon in the opposite direction. A nozzle can be compared to the opening of a balloon. Changing the size changes the amount of thrust generated. Nozzles have different shapes, just like airplanes have different shapes. There's always trade-offs in the design process. There certainly are, Karen. In fact, one of the trade-offs that we look at is the cost required to achieve the capability that we want to have. Sharon Jones is one of the people that helps evaluate these concepts from a cost standpoint. Sharon, why don't you talk a little bit about that? Well, Mike, what we do is we create a model of the aircraft on the computer so that way we can go in and change um, different aspects of the aircraft. We can um, look at what type of materials are we going to use, how big is the aircraft going to be, um, how many passengers will it carry, and also how much it's going to cost for the airlines to operate the aircraft. Thanks, Sharon. The last step in the process is to select and refine the solution. We'll take a look at that in a moment. But first, let's check in with Shelley and Van, where he's getting his own lesson on the balance of the four forces of flight. Oh, I'm getting suited up in my hang glider outfit thing here. And uh, yeah, alrighty. I'm gonna get hooked up here, getting ready for my first flight. And uh, I guess we'll catch y'all later. Back to you, Shelly. Well, it looks like Van is getting some final instructions before he's gonna find himself airborne. And me, I'm gonna change my clothes and I'll meet you back at the Connect Studio. And you guys, I'm sending you first on a final check and I'm going to send you to check out the most powerful tool used by aeronautical engineers when they're doing their investigations. That tool, the wind tunnel, such as those found at NASA Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia. Thanks, Shelley, and welcome back. It's at this point in our design process that we begin to refine our design. We do that by using scale models of the configuration and testing them in the wind tunnel. With me now is Zach Applin, who's head of some of our subsonic aerodynamics research here at Langley. Zach, why don't you take it from here? Hi, Mike. Many models can be made of an airplane concept. There can be part of the airplane, such as a wing or a tail, or the entire airplane itself. These models can range in size from just a few inches to as large as 12 feet as the 737 model behind us. We build these models up in this wind tunnel on top of these large 80,000 pound gantries. When we're ready for test, powerful jets actually float the entire structure about an inch off the floor. We then move the entire assembly into the wind tunnel for testing. A wind tunnel is basically a giant tapered tube with a large fan in the circuit. The wind tunnel simulates the flow of air as it glides over the plane's surface. 
Doing this in a wind tunnel gives us very controlled conditions to test out concepts from the design people. Talking about the blended wing body, we found the design to be very successful so far. It holds a lot of promise for the future. Thanks, Zach. Some of the concepts that you've seen today may very well be the airplanes you're flying in tomorrow. Math, science, engineering, teamwork, and problem solving are all important tools that have to be available for these airplanes to come into being for you in the future. Now back to you, Shelley. Wow! Let me tell you, that was a great trip visiting Hoot Gibson at the Dare County Airport in North Carolina. But you know, the variables of being outside in the wind and the rain can really get to you, and I'm glad to be back here in the Connect studio. Well, as Mike has said, it is today's students that will become NASA's future researchers. So, let's go visit Jones Magnet Middle School in Hampton, Virginia, where students are investigating an aeronautical challenge involving surface area and glide ratio. Follow along. And when we come back, we'll look at the data collected by these students, and then you, my friends, will be challenged to make your own analysis and predictions based upon their results. Hi, we're students from Jones Magnet Middle School in Hampton, Virginia. We were asked to investigate the glide ratio for different model airplane designs to determine which design provides the best glide ratio. The glide ratio of a plane describes the forward distance flown per drop in altitude in the absence of power and wind. For example, a 3 to 1 ratio means that if you are one mile up, you better be within three miles of the airport. Ms. Tominak and Ms. Barnwell, our science and math teachers, divided our class into four teams. The blue team, the red team, the yellow team, and the white team. Each team will fly a different design. To do our experiment, we use the following materials. Copy or paper. We use different colors to identify each team. We also used glue, a meter stick, and a tape measure. Each team was asked to select one design from the four patterns provided to us by NASA Langley. The shapes included the egret, the flex, the basic square, and the condor. Each team constructs a different model and calculates the total area of the paper used in creating the model. Next, we figure how much of the total area is actually devoted to the airplane's wing. Now we're ready to run our flight test. For our baseline test, we decide to launch the airplanes at 2 and 2 tenths meters from the ground. This becomes the plane's flight altitude. Our four groups conduct 10 test flights from this flight altitude. We're careful to launch each flight test from the same altitude and to be as consistent as possible in the force used to launch the airplane. We then measure the distance the plane goes from launch point to where it first touches the ground. We take our data, order it from shortest to longest distances, and then calculate the median and the mean for the data. We are now ready to compute the glide ratios for the shortest distance, the longest distance, the median, and the mean. Using the formula, horizontal distance divided by the change in altitude, we're ready to answer the question, which of the glide ratios that you have computed is the best one to use in describing your plane's glide ratio? Well, talking about variables, it looks like two of our NASA researchers have now joined us in the studio, and they've brought some aircraft models to share with us. And talking about research, it's time to make you a part of our audience research team. Over the next several minutes, you'll be presented with several questions related to the data collected from our Jones Magnet Middle School students. Then after this segment, our NASA researchers, Mike Logan and Zach Applin, will be taking your phone calls and emails through the numbers indicated at the bottom of the screen. Okay now, look carefully at the data and working with your fellow students, answer the questions as read aloud by Zach Applin, who is the assistant head of the Subsonic Aerodynamics Branch here at NASA Langley Research Center. Calculate the glide ratios for the shortest and longest distance flown.
calculate the mean and the median for the distance flown. Predict how far the airplane would glide if launched from a height twice the experimental altitude shown in trial 5. So, how do you think you did? Well, your mathematical computations and reasoning are important skills to answering the last questions. Also, are you ready with your own questions? Here we are now with me to field my questions are Mike and Zach. And shown on your set are the numbers to use. Now, please note that the telephone numbers are good only for today's November 10th broadcast. All right, let me begin. I've got a number of email questions that have come in, so I'm going to start with the email questions. My first question, if you take a look at it, is what is glide ratio? Mike or Zach, who'd like to answer that? I'll go ahead. Uh, the glide ratio, as you saw earlier, is the ratio of the horizontal distance flown to the altitude drop. Now, from a design standpoint, uh, we look at the, the glide ratio as the result of the aerodynamic efficiency, the, which is basically the lift versus the drag ratio or L over D. So when we design an airplane, glide ratio is important. That's a measure of the aerodynamic efficiency and how good the airplane is. All right, we had a question that was related to that. If we look at our second email question, someone wants to know, does weather affect glide ratio? It certainly can. Uh, in fact, when you, uh, earlier you saw the wind and the rain. Those are two factors that very heavily, in fact, impact the glide ratio. Uh, the more wind that you have and the higher the rainfall, the more likely you are to have not as good a glide ratio. Okay, so wind speed could be a, a factor here then. All right, well I know that we have a caller out there, so caller, how about giving us your name please and your question. Go ahead, caller, can you give us your name and your question? Michael Williams, I'd like to know, right. like to know how far could the first airplane that y'all showed go? could turn down your set and ask the question again. I think we would hear a little bit more clearly. Could you repeat that again, please? That's the fun doing that. Okay. Could you ask the question one more time then, please? Okay. How far did the first model go? How far did the model go? Are, are you referring to the student's model? Yeah. Well, you saw there on the, the data that they collected that it went, uh, they tried it 10 times, and we saw their data for five times, and you saw the distance for five of those flights. So your challenge is to go back and look at that data, and you could calculate the, the mean and the median for those five flights, and then you'll have that answer. Good question. All right, well, let me go back to my email. 
because I know I've got several questions that have come in here. Here's a question. How do researchers in designing an airplane decide what its wingspan should be? That's a good question, Shelley. Uh, it really depends on the aircraft mission. Uh, typically, transport aircraft have very long wingspans where they need high fuel efficiency. For fighter-type aircraft, you typically have shorter spans. You require a lot more structural strength out of the airplane. Uh, so you typically have a short span on fighter type configurations. Okay. All right, we got another email question that's kind of related to this. All right, and maybe you've, you've answered this already. How important is the width of a wingspan in an airplane's performance? In a very simple sense, I guess the longer the span, typically the more fuel efficient an airplane, airplane configuration would be. Okay. So that's why you see long spans on uh, commercial transport airplanes. All right. Well, I know we got another caller out there, so let's go ahead and go back to the phones. And caller, could you give us your name, please, and your question? Uh, yes, my name is Eric Morgan. I have a question for them. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, the little uh, perforated holes, or the little holes in a golf ball that help break down uh, wind turbulence for the golf ball, will that help on a plane's wing to reduce drag? Oh, good question. Who wants to take that one? Mike, Zach? I, I can do that one. Uh, as you know, the, the little dimples on a golf ball helps change the drag of the golf ball by creating turbulence. Now, in fact, uh, there's a similar system that can be applied to transport configurations called hybrid, hybrid laminar flow control, where, in fact, there's little holes that can either suck air in or blow air out that helps to create a smooth layer of air near the surface of the skin. That actually can reduce the drag of the airplane as much as 15 to 16 percent. All right, good question. Did you want to add something else? Yes, and actually a very similar application that's developed here at NASA Langley is a turbulent drag reduction in the form of, of what we call riblets, which are fairly rough surfaces along the airplane, which actually reduce the overall drag of the wing. All right, well, that's about all the time we have. So I'd like to thank all the guests that contributed to this program, including Mike and Zach, Paul, Karen, and Sharon. I'd also like to thank Jones Magnet Middle School, Dare County Airport, Air Venture 98, and Hoot Gibson, who did win his race. And finally, the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. Just a final reminder to check out the Shapes of Flight website where you will see, hear, and learn more about today's topic. Also, we invite you to camp out with like-minded students in our special virtual aeronautics camp. No sleeping bags required, just some creativity and mathematics and science know-how. Videotape copies of this show along with the lesson plan may be attained from NASA Central Operation of Resources for Educators or CORE. And now, back to Van for his final ascent into the air. I'm Shelley Kianwright for NASA Connect. Thanks for joining us. We'd like to give a special thanks to Kitty Hawk Kites for letting us use the hang glider and uh, Dr. Regallo for appearing on our show. So connect with us next time when we connect you to math, science, and NASA. I'm Van Hughes. See you later. That looks good right there. Up a little higher. Up, 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 up. Right there. Stay loose with your hands. And look ahead. Clear. Walk. Look ahead. Now run like that. Faster. Faster. Just let it go. Faster. Faster. And just let it go. Let go. Let go. Okay. One, one inch. Right there. Perfect. There, right there. Oh, keep it out, keep it out. Oh, hold it out. Yeah. Woo. You got it, man. Yeah. Yeah. Set it down. What do you think? <laughs> I did it. <laughs> How did you do, Doc? I love it. Best sport in the world. <laughs>